imagine there's no heaven of socialist appeal, part of the international Marxist tendency. As you can tell, there's a lot of one political ideology going on. <laughs> but despite that, we are open to all opinions, and please feel free to debate, argue with each other, and get into the real message behind it all. So what are we discussing today? The question is, is Corbyn the future for Labour? Uh, in recent, uh, it was a shock last year after the loss of Labour in the 2015 general election, the resignation of Ed Miliband, that of what appeared to start off as an incredibly boring leadership election, one man took it by storm. With barely enough MPs to get onto the ballot, he quickly became incredibly popular among the membership, uh, attracting crowds of thousands to church halls, uh, meeting rooms, pubs, as soon, uh, across the country. Uh, this man was Jeremy Corbyn. Despite all the uh, labor establishment trying to uh, shut him down, from Tony Blair to uh, Gordon Brown to all former um, prime ministers, etc., Corbyn was able to win the election with a stunning mandate of over 65%. Since then, there's been attempts to uh, coup him have come up almost every time there's been a general, uh, every time there's been a chance. In, uh, as soon as uh, he won the election in the, with the conference in Brighton in November, uh, people argued that there should be a coup there. After the, uh, general, after the local elections in May, there should be a coup there. And yet now, after the shocking, shocking results of Brexit, they have, uh, uh, the right-wing Blairites, as some have argued, others have argued, those with the interests of Labour at heart, have, tried, have made their stand and with, stu and with a huge attack have tried to oust Jeremy Corbyn. We've seen this with a, a vote of no confidence, which saw 160 MPs uh, vote out, vote for him to out, with only 40 remaining. People were shocked who were these 40 who supported him in the first place. <laughs> but Corbyn has stood strong. But what is the future? Should Corbyn stay? Should Corbyn go? Is Corbyn leading the Labour Party to new and inspiring places, or simply repeating the same old song worn out throughout its 100-year history? To answer this question, we have Sam Watling here, uh, writer for Brighton Left, generally quite a clever guy. Um, he's going to speak for about 20 minutes, give like an introduction, uh, sum it all up, a few points here and there, and then we're out to the audience to discuss this question in depth. Uh, so Sam, yeah, well, 20 uh, minutes, uh, uh, take uh, it away. Uh, um, I think you've uh, given quite a wide breadth, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to cover it, <laughs> but um, yeah, we'll see what we can do. Um, I think we're, um, to start off, I would like to say that, um, I personally think that we should celebrate a rather successful two weeks in terms of Labour Party politics. If you look at it, you know, the head of the Conservative Party has resigned, the head of UKIP has resigned, admittedly the head of the Liberal Democrats hasn't, but no one actually has, and the head of Labour is still there. So actually, you know, by um, a, a, a raw poll, um, Corbyn is actually doing pretty well. Actually, pr pretty well. Uh, for most part of leadership disputes, you know, it has been pretty standard. Corbyn has only split the Labour Party, well, the bu Labour bureaucracy, as it were, while the Conservatives' internal party struggle has split the entire country. L Labour are only thinking of, well, maybe if we just kick one guy out, it'll solve the problem. And the Conservatives are more, well, if we just kick three million EU citizens out, then <laughs> it, it may solve the problem. So I may be slightly more optimistic than lots of people would think. But, you know, aside from the jokes, um, we, um, we I shouldn't deny that the uh, Labour Party, the party that so many of us have tried to infiltrate and hijack for so many years, is now in a state of open civil war between the parliamentary faction of the Labour Party, its established group who have run it for God knows how, well, you know, when the late as the, it is a Labour Party, and everyone else in the party who voted, you know, the large sections who voted for Jeremy Corbyn, a vote of no, an actual vote of no confidence in the leadership with that level of dislike for the leader is unprecedented in Labour Party history. Why does a vote of no confidence have no power? Because no one ever thought they'd be happy to bother to use it. That even in the dark days of the early 1980s when the Labour Party split, you have never seen a form of such vicious infighting the Labour Party as you have now, until going back to something like the 1930s. 
like stuff like this just hasn't generally happened in Labour's history. Sorry. And after the unions were neutered on the Thatcher and Clause 4 was abolished, you, on the Blair, you know, these problems, these debates over the Directing Party were supposed to be effectively over. And yet it has come back in possibly one of you, in this terrible and cataclysmic fight over, over the Solvent Party at a crucial time in UK politics. And if this continues to the extent, the resulting division will probably eclipse the um, party infighting of the 1980s when we have, you know, the SDP, the expulsion of the left and militant, and Labour effectively being in the political wilderness for 10 years. Though, so though we have um, this in, in almost incredible system that we're going in, it is, of course, incredibly difficult to tell what is going to happen because at, in this political time, time, events move fast and are difficult to keep track of. But I would suggest that there would be, I would say, around three main possible outcomes for um, this. The first is that Corbyn, probably, this is probably the most unlikely outcome, but the first is that Corbyn does some magical political pirouette um, unseen in um, the history of recent British politics and effectively um, somehow makes a peace treaty or concordat um, with the Labour Party and is allowed or him or John McDonnell or someone to stay on as leader and some kind of compromise is sorted out. Considering the current situation, just how bitterly everyone is opposed to each other, that doesn't seem particularly likely. So the two other probable, more likely options is there is just simply a Labour Party coup. Somehow they get Corbyn out. Somehow Angela Eagle wins. You know, these all these sixty thousand people who recently joined the Labour Party actually join to support the moderation and um, compromising ability of Angela Eagle during these tough times, to the surprise of everyone. Or more probably, the most likely. Um, outcome, kudos to the international Marx tendency for saying this quite a lot, is that the Labour Party is probably going to split, and, and in quite a large way. Uh, magazines like The Economist have been suggesting this for ages, mostly because they want the Labour Party to split, so they hate Corbyn. But, you know, quite a lot of people hate Corbyn and wouldn't mind the Labour Party splitting in the Labour Party itself. And once it gets to a stage when they, if they lose a leadership election, aka they can't ask Corbyn, and Corbyn, because Corbyn is simply too well entrenched with his supporters, and they cannot negotiate a uh, compromise that is worth it, because, you know, it would be, to accept Jeremy Corbyn, or even John McDonnell as their leader, would be effectively making a humiliating climb down from what was an open declaration of civil war, that the part that is very difficult for the party, for party in Chita to recover from, from. And so, this appears to me the most likely option. Most of the MPs go to one side in, in, well, the Social Democratic Party, the Independent Labour Party, the Reform Tory Party, who knows? And on the other side, you have, the, I assume, the Still Labour Party with maybe 40, 30 MPs and most of its membership being the more basically left-wing, radical, Eurosceptic wing of the Labour Party. You know, you, have, you basically have New Labour and Old Labour if that's the most obvious thing you can decide. decide. And so why has a party that has um, you know, generally been a surprisingly successful motley coalition between the middle class liberals of the Bloomsbury group of um, British Socialists of the Fabian Society and the British Union movement suddenly at this point decided to implode at a time when a uh, social democratic voice or a europhile voice or an anti-austerity voice, depending on how you see of it, is in high demand in the UK. Why has, you know, a party who has their first option after the European referendum been to go out onto the party headquarters and say, the British people vote to leave the EU, we are now going to shoot ourselves in the face? And um, this, I think, is a, um, the inevitable conclusion, uh, as you know, expected from 
martyrs of a very long historical process in the Labour Party, which I've luckily written down here and I'm going to bore you with. Um, the Labour Party, in my opinion, has suffered a long time split, not just between um, Blairites and old Labour, as it has been embodied in the present day, but there has always been um, a split, not just between the between what you call the moderate and radical factions of the party. For every um, Tony Benn, you had a Dennis Healy kind of thing. For every Nye Bevan, you had a Hugh Gates goal. And this difference in parties is generally manageable. The Conservatives, you know, have done it, even though they may have accidentally broke up the UK. But the Conservatives <laughs> have managed to do it for, you know, several centuries. The Liberals well, kind of did it for a century constantly reforming their parties, and yet Labour are unable at this point in time to manage this motley coalition. And, and because I, of will, you have to see this current split as the result of the triumphs, arguable triumphs, and more importantly, the failures of the last Labour government. You know, lots of people um, will say that, oh, the last Labour government under Brown and Blair was actually... Um, extremely good because they increased public spending, you know, they were in many ways the anti-austerity before austerity even became a thing. thing. Actually, um, if you look at most of it, they simply, it's true that their philosophy of if we just spend more money, if we expand the state, then that will deal with the contradictions of capitalism, became a thing. Then the Labour Party, the party, did, um, and that became effectively a social democratic view of the Labour Party, which became popular during this period, and and especially with a large section of the more middle class force of the Labour Party, who surprise surprise, where a lot of them were in government services, where are quite a lot of the Blairite supporters in the government, or in lots of the less radical public professions, you know, who want to protect our NHS by just simply spending a bit more money, you know, which is ineffectively what the Labour Party's proposal was to do for the past two elections. We will cut by £20 billion less in the 2010 elections, we will probably cut less by around the same amount in the 2015 elections. And so this, you know, the Blairite Social Democratic wing was in, um, uh, in conflict with the more radical workers wing, wing that was supposed to be internal decline after the internal party conflicts of the 1980s and the defeat of the unions as a political force in the 1980s. Actually, instead, what we have seen is the Blairites were over-optimistic. And, and after, you know, the effective failure of social democracy to win Labour anything, any seat in Parliament, or any general election for the last two elections, there has been looking for an alternative. And what do they see in the party? That they dust off this old, you know, Jeremy Corbyn is an old, one of the old guard elected in 1983, and, and resurrect the more socialist old Labour wing of the party, see, and begin to support that. So this extremely old, um, you know, 80s conflict in the Labour Party has suddenly been given a fresh vigour at a time of extreme existential crisis for the party in general. <laughs> in general. So you effectively have, you know, one side who wants to more protect the state and, you know, moderate the problems of society, the contradictions that we live in, and another society, uh, another wing that, uh, well, in the past at least, was mainly worker-based, wanted to protect the unions, workers' rights, and we just work well, in a very, very radical way, which, uh, um, which, the, um, which you know has been denounced by the social democratic wing. Um, this this came to a head um, in the after uh, just before the defeat of Miliband, effectively, when there had been and political commentators were noticing a shift to the left in um, political um, ideology in the Labour Party. Um, I and an increasing difference between them and the established party establishment. So we have had. For example, the um, the idea of nuclear disarmament was becoming far more popular even before Corbyn took office. Ideas of renationalisation, you know, all our policies, but they were becoming more far more popular before Corbyn took office. And what happens when someone who enjoys these ideas and you know was consistently for these ideas um, joins in? Oh, we're going to vote for him. 
and such in a nutshell is effectively how Corbyn won. And indeed, you know, um, the victory of Corbyn was not as a disaster, I think, as many Labour Party members would have you believe, because in truth, the Social Democratic apparatus have been tested to the people of Britain in successive elections and had effectively failed. You may kid yourself and think it was Ed Miliband's inability to eat a bacon sandwich that lost Labour the election in 2015, and I would highly disagree. It, you know, there, um, and you will see this again in lots of the establishment Labour ideas, and when we come to Europe, we'll talk about that. But that, you know, lots of the ideas are simply just inconsistent, worse versions of the Tories, or effectively um, entirely contradictory. But based with the desire to make the market work and locate the market but also to go to, um, to promote social trends that effectively go against the market. And you could generally do this by pleasing everyone when you had money available and were able to run big deficits like the last Labour government, but cannot do that anymore when you, have to, when you are in a period of economic turmoil. So you actually have to start thinking of innovative ideas. And this is partly of at least the Labour establishment's problem. They had none, so Corbyn won. It was quite simple as that. As that. As that. And of course, the problems of the short term consequences in the Labour Party are the European referendum. Them. Them. And you know, the fact that many Labour supporters, and especially the Labour Party, are furious, to say the least, that we have left the pet project of many um, of the old um, moderates in the Labour Party, you know, Neil Kinnock was president of the European Commission, of the EU. Like, um, Corbyn had, in effect. Um, and so the members of the party problems have come to a head because they probably wrongly blame Corbyn for their defeat in not encouraging enough the Labour supporters to go out and vote to remain in the EU. And so they blame him for that, and now that is their casus belli or reason to kick him out of the party, as well as all the other things they don't like about him, aka they completely disagree with literally everything he stands for. So, do I have five Yeah, oh god. Um, yes. And in fairness, you know, there was a point. Um, Corbyn, and lots of the criticism of Corbyn about the European uh, referendum is actually highly misplaced. If you look it's true, the arguments for a left-wing exit weren't particularly convincing, but the arguments for Le Main, or left-wing Remain, were absolutely terrible. I was unironically told at a Brighton Salon meeting a few, well, about one month ago that the solution to the extremely complex problems of the European Union, in a way to get better deals with the ideals of socialism, was simply to vote harder for more people to go out into the European elections. Now, I'm, now, if you are simply blaming the electorate for the failure of the European Union and coming up with these huge ideas of, oh, we can reform the European Union while you're inside, which have literally leave no one with any incentive to remain in the European Union, then your arguments are terrible. And if Jeremy Corbyn is not an idiot, say many things, he may apparently be an anti-Semite, a communist, or a Nazi, but he, is, I, he isn't that stupid and so would not support, lead you know, the Labour Party rank and file into a fight based on stupid terms that did not really affect them. You know, it was, for all intents and purposes, <coughs> inviting the Tory party. And there was no reason to alienate large amounts of the, um, wor of, you know, the working class of Britain who h hated, um, who you know, v were indifferent about Brexit anyway, um, um, so, you know, oh, can you please go out and fight for the Labour Party because we'll give you some better terms and conditions, I promise. It protects this stuff. No. And if they had done that, you may have seen a similar situation to what happened in Scotland, where the Labour Party l did a, a, a weird lacklustre campaign against Scottish independence. You know, Alice Dine led the Better Together campaign and were absolutely wiped out. It may have been that the Labour Party, you know, after going into bed with the Conservative Unionists, for, you know, once again, and may have lost large amounts of seats to UKIP if such a situation had emerged. And so I, I think that Corbyn's decision to not involve himself in the EU campaign that much is actually more prudent than most people give him credit for. If there's one thing you can criticise him on, is probably um, he didn't, was one thing he actually believed in, he probably did not make, a, you know, a, a, a case against the anti-immigrant rhetoric that we heard a lot of, which lots of his supporters probably would want 
him to do. The best he could do was, due to a lack of leadership, when people like Tom Watson were saying, no, don't worry, we're going to close the borders, I promise, was to counteract that, but that was about it. He didn't, you know, say why we need immigrants, why we like immigrants, why the immigrants who make up our, most of our supporter base, you know, our, our Labour Party, but instead, you know, allowed that kind of pandering to go on. And once again, the Labour Party is still extremely divided on immigration. Well done. So what, so what is, the, is the position now? Now, they, or what should we do? Do we support a, um, the party moderates in their attempt to defend Europe? Or do we support the party members and their trade union backers in attempt to defend Corbyn? Now, I mean, theoretically, both might happen. You know, um, you'd expect a political party or the members of it after a defeat to actually, you know, consider their opinion about the EU and what position the Labour Party should go forward. In fact, they haven't done that. They've tried to stab Corbyn repeatedly to death. So those two are mutually exclusive. But given the choice, it appears that actually, actually, you probably, at least from a left-wing perspective, that you may as well want to defend Corbyn. Like it or not, before or after Brexit, the same fundamental problems and contradictions in British society are still going to remain. The problem of low wage growth, which has plagued our society ever since the 1980s for the poorest, and unemployment in certain um, regions that have been affected by deindustrialization, is not simply going to go away because we have less Eastern Europeans coming. Sim similarly, it will not. Similarly, the dominance of the a uh, uh, part, party in politics is not going to be solved. They have actually managed to co-opt the Brexit debate. And so we do need a, um, a better and more interesting Labour Party, which is prepared to countenance more radical ideas, ideas to defend the poor of Britain from whatever happens, be it in the EU or outside of the EU. We, ne we need, you know, some kind of socialist movement. And it appears at this moment that, you know, whether you agree with him on Europe or not, the, the Labour Party, in its current state, is the best position to do that, with a large, new-growing membership and, a, and legitimate enthusiasm, which you haven't seen, at least in their core lands, for some time. 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 That being said, you know, I am not happy with everything the Labour Party believes. I think they should move from uh, just saying they're anti-austerity, because apparently everyone's anti-austerity now. But even the Conservatives aren't going to, to balance the budget anymore. You know, and actually think of ideas of how to boost investment, of how to increase you know, ideas of workplace democracy, and how, um, and how to build a more liberal society, uh, and socialist society, um, you know, against both the um, conservative elites of the country and the conservative or liberal elites of the EU. You know, perhaps address, as we now have control of the borders, to let more refugees in rather than let them drown in the Mediterranean. As we have control over labour laws, maybe make them more equitable, and those kind of things. And hopefully that is the Labour Party we as Marxists would quite like to see emerge from it, so we can hijack it slightly better. But, but from that, um, so um, my, and I think the recommendation of everyone here is, yes, we should defend Corbyn, but it's not simply enough to defend Corbyn and just let, you know, um, Momentum or the students on social media do what they want. We have to defend Corbyn, but also fight for, fight for socialism and, uh, um, and, press, uh, um, and press for a more innovative Labour Party programme. But if we can save Corbyn, I see no reason that we cannot do that as well. Thank you.